Okay, great. Let's go. All right, so I would like to introduce uh, Miss Laura Lee Thompson. Um, she is a fourth generation Floridian and co owner of the popular Dixie Crossroads Seafood Restaurant in Tiesville, Florida, which specializes in serving wild caught domestic seafood. Uh, Laura Lee participates on numerous boards and committees supporting tourism, the commercial fishing industry, and the environment. She served for 20 years on the Brevard County Tourist Development Council, and she always works to preserve and promote our region's incomparable outdoor assets. So I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Laura Lee for a talk on Indian River Legacy. So I'm going to... You are now unmuted. All right. Am I showing up on their screen right now? All right. Hi, hi everybody. Thank you for taking your valuable time to join me today, and I hope you like my talk. Um, I want to start out and 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 say uh, I've been doing this talk for about 20 years now. Um, never with slides before, so th this um, pictures are new. Um, I pulled a lot of them off of the internet, um, and I was able to track down some of the people that took the pictures. I'm in the process of trying to track down the rest of them. But um, you might see one of your pictures in my slideshow today, because there's a lot of them. Or you might see yourself in my slideshow today. So if, if you see yourself or you see one of your pictures and you don't want me to use it, please let me know and I will remove it. Or if you see one of your pictures and you want to let me know that you saw it, I'd be happy to add you to the photo credits. So. It's an amazing collection of really, really nice stuff. And I really appreciate um, the use of the images. Um, I'm assuming that the fair use um, law would, would cover me using them because this is an educational talk. But if you see something that belongs to you and you don't want me to use it, please let me know. So, this is my playground, the, the northern end of the Indian River and the southern end of the Mosquito Lagoon. Um, this is where I played until I was 17 years old and started venturing further south in the lagoon. So um, you'll hear me talking about a lot of these things today, so we're just going to go through and, and get it oriented. So this X right here where it says our house in the fishing pier, that is um, where we lived. Uh, the Titusville Pier was right next to the um, the uh, Titusville Bridge, which is here. The railroad bridge is just to the north, a couple miles to the north. Um, this area right here, this is old orange groves. This was the original Indian River citrus um, area. So some of the oldest groves along the Indian River Lagoon were planted along here. Um, a lot of the groves are gone now, but um, the homes that are being built there are being built on five and 10 acre lots. So there's not a lot of development here. It's not heavily developed. Up here, we call this the head of the river. Um, this is Turnbull Creek. This is the freshwater input for the northern end of the Indian River Lagoon. Turnbull Creek drains a big, huge swamp that actually goes from Mims all the way to Edgewater. So that, that freshwater sh uh, flow comes down Turnbull Creek and into um, the head of the Indian River Lagoon. Sorry about that. So this is the Merritt Island Wildlife Refuge over here, Kennedy Space Center. This is the Mosquito Lagoon. This is Hallover Canal. It connects the Indian River to the Mosquito Lagoon. Uh, coming south, there's the shuttle landing strip, the shuttle launch pads. Um, this is Banana Creek. Um, once upon a time, Banana Creek actually connected to Banana River. This is the northern end of the Banana River right here. And this is Happy Creek right here. 
my grandparents had a home on Happy Creek that I happily played in as a child. This 1950s brochure is from the Happy Creek Hunting and Fishing Lodge. Before NASA took over the Northern Merritt Island, um, this is what it looked like. The Google Earth image is Banana Creek and how it looks uh, today. So you can see Banana Creek has been completely severed um, from the Banana River by the shuttle crawler way. Um, and, um, and State Road 3. So you used to be able to um, take a boat and go all the way around Merritt Island by going um, across Banana Creek on the north end and then around Dragon Point on the south end and coming back up. You could make a big circle all the way around um, southern, southern um, end of Merritt Island. Um, this was an extremely productive area um, where my grandparents lived. The oysters were so, there were so many oysters that you couldn't wade out into the river, um, even if you had on tennis shoes, because you couldn't get through the oysters. All of the homeowners had docks to get out over the oysters that lined the shorelines. And um, so they had to have a dock to get out um, to where the water was to get over the oyster beds. That's how many oysters there were. And now it's just a big polluted green. You can see the difference in the water color between this part of Banana Creek, which is completely walled off now by the Space Center activities versus the color of Banana Creek out here and the color of the Indian River Lagoon. It's very, very different. You can actually see the polluted water coming under State Road 3 and you can see the color change right in here. Um, these once productive waters are now dead zones. The Northern Banana River and Banana Creek were forever changed through activities at the Space Center with little regard for the environment or for the economic and emotional hardships imposed on displaced fishing families. Before spaceships and cruise ships made their way to our community, citrus and fishing were Brevard County's biggest industries. Net fishing was a profitable enterprise in the Indian River Lagoon. When the railroad came, it so advanced the progress of commercial fishing that our region's fish production was described as a major factor in our nation's food supply. In 1922, the fishing industry in Titusville was bigger than the citrus industry. Before refrigeration, fish were salted and packed in barrels for the train trip north to New York's Fulton Fish Market. The skiffs on which these boys are playing, this is what fishermen used to hunt fish. There were so many fish back then, all you needed was oars to chase them. Fishing was a family operation and children were taken out on the water at an early age. Sometimes so many mullet were caught, the net had to be pulled into the boat, fish and all. The fishermen would then go to the shore where the net could be pulled off the boat and the fish taken out. This was before synthetics. Their nets were made of natural fibers like cotton. They, the nets were hung on racks to dry after every use or they would rot. With the introduction of monofilament, net racks became a relic of the past. If you ask a fisherman which fish should be restocked in the Indian River, they'll tell you trout, redfish, black drum, and snook. If you ask me, it's all about mullet. For mullet are the bottom of the food chain. Everything eats mullet, including the previously mentioned sport fish. When our Indian River once again becomes home to massive schools of mullet and catches like these, all of those other fish will be there too. My family's been here in Florida for a very long time, and like many other folks that live in our great state, they started out from other places. Before the Civil War, my great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather, left the industrial Northeast to start a new life in Florida. He bought land in a cabin from a Long Island nurseryman who had purchased the property in order to collect rare plants. The cabin sat on top of an Indian mound, right where the transparent waters of Blue Spring Run disappear into the tannin-stained St. John's River. It was there that Lewis Thursby established a landing and a trading post to cater to the rapidly growing steamship commerce along the St. John's River. The cabin was too small for his growing family, so he replaced it with a bigger house. 
Bustling with the turmoil of nine children, the Thursby home was always open to visiting scientists and adventurers who flocked to Florida to study its strange flora and fauna. Of major interest were tiny biological communities near Florida's extraordinary springs, where tropical plants grew well beyond their northern limits, able to survive because the constant flow of 72 degree water tempered winter's chill. The scientists encouraged Lewis's younger children to collect eggs and bird nests. The older kids were taught to process skins from birds and animals that they shot. The children's work went to museums and collections of the wealthy in the civilized North, where the public was mesmerized by this mysterious exotic setting in the South. When we were young, a treasured summer pastime was to journey inland and visit our Aunt Belle at the Thursby home. The youngest of Lewis's children, Isabel Thursby, was still living in the early 1960s, but she was very old. We loved going to Blue Spring. The mystifying fact that crystal clear water sprung from the ground was as fascinating to us as it was to the scientists who visited Lewis and his family in their splendid home nearly a century before our arrival. Completely opposite to their warmth in winter, the waters were shockingly cold in the searing heat of summer, a welcome effect for a family who had no air conditioning. My early childhood was spent in a house that was next to a body of water that was very different than Blue Spring. We had the great fortune to live right on the shore of the Indian River. My dad built his race boats and his first commercial line of fiberglass boats on the ground floor of the building and our family crammed into the small apartment above. The four of us, along with various cousins and friends who were actually allowed to play with us, evolved into the pier gang. That's because my grandfather ran the nearby Titusville Pier and that's where we hung out. We terrorized the kids from town and a nearby trailer park when they came out to the pier to fish. Fishing was the major tourist activity in Titusville as it was in many other coastal communities. There were lots of fishing piers in Florida back then and most operators charged a fee. Our pier was different because my grandfather didn't charge people to fish off of his dock. He was comfortable making a living just off of selling bait and tackle and renting fishing poles and shrimp nets and lights. My dad added power lines under the railings, which was another thing that made our pier unique. You could use electric lights instead of messing around with fussy gas lanterns. My grandfather proudly marketed his pride and joy as the world's longest free fishing pier where one could fish at night with electric light. The pier was a big part of Titusville's social life, especially during shrimping season. Springtime shrimp runs were a huge event. On a good run, you could quickly fill up several buckets with shrimp. And you never could tell when the shrimp would run. Usually it was freezing cold and really early in the morning, like around four o'clock. When the shrimp started running, my grandfather would call two or three folks on the phone and they'd call the rest of their buddies. Within minutes, the pier would be covered with people, many of whom were still in their pajamas and bedroom shoes. They didn't want to lose the time it took to get dressed. Sometimes the shrimp only ran for just a few minutes. Dad's job was to get out of bed and go out to the bay house to help my grandfather rent nets and lights. We considered it our duty to race up and down the pier, jumping over poles and getting in people's way. Any misstep would send someone's carefully arranged nets and fishing rods flying. We spent a lot of time running from angry grown-ups and flapping bathrobes. They hated to hear us come thundering down the pier. There was a small boat basin with a ramp by our house. My father built a dock so that people could tie up their boats after putting them in the water. When the wind blew out of the east, big mats of seagrass drifted in. Then the manatees would come, only we called them sea cows. We could sit on the dock and touch the backs of the grazing cow sea cows with our bare feet. When I was seven, I inherited a small rowboat that came with restrictions. I was not allowed to go past the entrance to the boat basin. I didn't mind because there were all kinds of things to see just in the small world of our boat basin. Sea squirts, barnacles, and oysters grew on all of the breakwaters and pilings. 
a variety of interesting creatures could be found just by turning over rocks. Back then, you could walk along any shoreline of the river and there would be fiddler crabs as far as you could see. The big ones would hang outside their burrows, waving their big claws, trying to attract a lady fiddler. When approached, they'd race toward their holes with a whispery whoosh. And the motion of hundreds of fiddler crabs running for cover looked like water parting as you moved along the shore. With the coming of spring, hordes of bigger crabs made their presence known. It's hard to imagine how many horseshoe crabs were in the river when I was young. They would crawl up on the shore to lay their eggs, and the whole shoreline would be covered with horseshoe crabs, and more of them would be wading out in the water. You knew they were there because you could see their tails waving in the air like sticks above the surface. Warm weather also welcomed jellyfish season. Summer, summer, in the summertime, clouds of moon jellies would float into our boat basin. Sometimes there were so many moon jellies that it seemed like you could walk on them. They were all different sizes. You could see them all the way from the bottom of the river to the surface. They filled the entire water column. Moon jellies were everywhere, and they'd be that thick from the head of the river up by Scottsmore all the way down to Stewart. Dad showed us how to pick up the moon jellies without being stung. It's really not that hard. Um, you want to make sure you pick the right jellyfish. You don't want to pick one that's a couple of feet down. You want to pick one that's floating up near the surface. And you just put your hand right on top of the jelly and you shove your hand down in the water and you turn your hand over at the same time that you're pushing the jellyfish down. And when you bring your hand up, there's the jellyfish upside down on top of your hand where it can't sting you. We had some spectacular battles using moon jellies as projectiles. After a major fight, the dirt road by our house would be covered with blobs of jelly. We'd laugh and run when cars squashed them. We were kind of perverted when we were kids. We even rigged up catapults that could fling moon jellies for great distances, like Larry the Cable Guy with his watermelon launcher, only our hurling mechanism was much cruder. Cooler weather brought the comb jellies, only we called them pocketbook jellies because to us, they looked like pocketbooks and they had an inside compartment. Some of y'all may not know what a pocketbook is. That's what Southern ladies called purses. All Southern ladies had a collection of pocketbooks. My grandma Thompson was buried with her favorite pocketbook in her hands. We'd never heard of pocketbooks being called purses until all the Northerners started moving down here because of the Space Center. Pocketbook jellies were special because you could pick them up without getting stung. You could hold them in your hand and see all the colors of the rainbow as their fluids moved through them. They were all different sizes. There were comb jellies so small you could barely see them, all the way up to jellies that were bigger than my hand. The tiny ones were wonderful to put in jars with river water. When you held them up to the sunlight, it was like holding a container full of prisms. Comb jellies are bioluminescent. When you jiggle them or hit them with a kayak paddle at night, they glow like green fire. You could catch all kinds of fish off the pier when I was little. Back then, the water in the lagoon was much cleaner. In fact, a stroll down any dock in the early 1960s was like wandering over a giant aquarium. At times, the water was so clear, you could go all the way out to the end of the pier and see the bottom. Even though it was more than 10 feet deep out there, you could see the fish swimming right up to your bait. And it's hard to believe how many blowfish were in the river when I was a kid. There were so many blowfish, you couldn't get your bait through them to reach the fish you wanted to catch. Frustrated anglers would leave them on the pier to die, hoping to thin them out. The pier was always covered with dead blowfish. Some of them puffed up before they expired and remained so after their demise. We like to run up and down the pier and kick them back in the water, but you had to be careful not to kick a blowfish in the mouth with your bare toe because they have razor sharp teeth that can really hurt you even when they're dead. Every evening, bottlenose dolphins fed outside the entrance to our boat basin. We could stand on the pier and see the dolphins tossing mullet in the air and leaping after them. Watching the dolphins from our pier 
was better than being at Marineland because the dolphins were in the wild, in their home, in our river. I got a little older and my dad gave me a little three horsepower kicker for my rowboat. Suddenly my world expanded. I could finally reach the closest spoil islands and go all the way over to the east side of the lagoon. I began my career as a tour guide, taking my friends out on the water, always eager to show them my beloved Indian River. The following summer, my dad announced that it was time for me to start working. My grandfather needed live bait shrimp to sell at the pier and I was going to catch them. I was 10 years old. I don't think the child labor laws were as restrictive back then as they are today. If they were, my dad figured our family was exempt. He helped me expand the live well in my rowboat and built a push net so I could catch bait shrimp for the pier. It's hard work, as you can see by these pictures. Even for a grown-up, I must have looked pretty funny pushing that big net around, but I was one happy kid. Every morning, we loaded my rowboat into the back of Dad's truck and took it up to the Hallover Canal, and Dad would drop me and the boat off and drive away. I'd spend the day doing whatever I wanted to do. Of course, I had to push the net some and catch some shrimp to justify the trip to the canal, but I mostly spent my time exploring. There were colorful corals and sponges and algae that grew on the rocks, their rich, vibrant hues visible far below the surface. It was a great place to watch for dolphins, and sometimes I was lucky to see a sea turtle cruising through. The best place for push for shrimp was in the seagrass beds along the western sides of the string of spoil islands that run north from Holover Canal. I loved seeing all the things that got captured in my push net. I caught magical creatures like pipefish and seahorses, weird looking spider crabs, and little tiny porcupine fish and blowfish. I also caught a lot of shrimp. Sometimes I'd bump up against a ray that was so big, it would knock the handle of the net out of my hands as it leaped off the bottom and flapped away in a big cloud of sand. Dad came back in the afternoon and we put my shrimp in a bucket with an air pump for the ride back to town to sell my shrimp to my grandfather at his pier. The following year, I advanced to a bigger boat with a 20 horsepower motor. I could now get to haul over canal under my own power. We built some pigfish traps and I added pigfish income to my shrimp, shrimp money. So you can see the pigfish there. It's a colorful little fish. Um, like many other fish, the pigfish use the Indian River as a nursery ground. So when the, um, the little pigfish grow up, they go out in the ocean. Um, but then they come back into the river to spawn. I preferred to pull my pigfish traps early. The pigfish were so thick, my traps were half full when I dragged them out of the water, the tiny fish shimmering gold in the morning light. After checking the pigfish traps, I went behind the islands to push my net around for bait shrimp. By early afternoon, I headed back to the pier, hoping to beat the afternoon thunderstorms. The following summer, one of the commercial fishermen asked me why was I selling my pigfish for bait? He said I could make a lot more money if I used my pigfish to catch fish. He taught me how to splatter pull for sea trout. The term splatter pulling comes from what you do with the end of the pole. Every once in a while, you stick it in the water and thrash it back and forth, and then you beat and fram it on top of the water, and it makes a lot of splashing noise. That makes a sound like a school of fish feeding on top of the water and the big fish move in to see who's eating what. You wanna fish right off the back of the boat and let the wind push you down the edge of the seagrass where it starts breaking up and getting spotty. That's where the big fish are. And you have to keep your line tight. Every once in a while, you kind of bump the end of the, um, the bottom of the pole and that sends a shock up the line to through the tip of the pole and down the line and it dumps the pigfish upside down. That makes the pigfish mad and it grunts like a little pig and that's what attracts the trout. It was easy to catch 50 pounds of trout in just a morning of fishing. That old fisherman was right. I made a lot more money using the pigfish for bait but I always saved a few for my grandfather to sell at the pier. I spent the next couple of summers content with trapping pigfish and fishing for sea trout. After that, true greed set in and I got a bigger boat, a 23 footer with a 75 horsepower motor. 
my friends helped me build 150 blue crab traps. Back then, it didn't matter where you put a trap in the water, it would always have crabs the next day. I pull my traps every afternoon after school, spending countless hours on the water. The next year, my grandpa Watt would co-sign for my first bank loan, and I financed enough money to buy 500 yards of gill net, a bigger motor, and a bow runner mullet boat. I started spending entire nights out on the lagoon doing my homework under the dim glow of a 15 watt light bulb. One of my favorite places to fish was Banana Creek, which was full of alligators, some of whom were really big. When I'd shine my spotlight down the shoreline, dozens of big red eyes glared back at me. The alligators liked to swim along my net looking for an easy meal. Now, I didn't mind donating an occasional fish to a large gator to keep him happy. There were two problems. The first one being that the gators were discerning diners. They definitely preferred the 50 cent a pound spotted sea trout over the nickel a pound mullet. The second problem was that the gators couldn't get the fish out of the net by pulling on it backwards. The gator would swim up to the net, grab a trout and start jerking. When the trout wouldn't come out, the gator would give up, swim right by my fat gilled mullet as it searched for its next spotted morsel. The gator would work its way down the net, punching holes in my trout, rendering them totally useless except for crab bait, and I would be madly pulling my boat after it. It must have been a pretty comical sight, a 16-year-old girl out in the river in the middle of the night whacking a 10-foot gator on the head with an oar to make it let go of my fish. I loved being out on the river by myself after dark. On calm, moonless nights, every star reflects in the water, and you can't tell where the river stops and the sky begins. Running the river on a night like that was like flying through the Milky Way. On summer nights, the bioluminescence was spectacular. Staring down into the dark water was like peering into a fairyland. Tiny, luminous creatures scattered through shimmering seagrass like flickering stars. Schools of mullet panicked as I drew near, sparking radiant jade explosions on the surface and fireworks down below. Bottlenose dolphins streaked beneath my boat and burst from the water, showering brilliant fluorescence. When the wind blew, you could stand on the Titus Hill Causeway and look east into the darkness over a river that was alive with dazzling green whitecaps. When the northeasters of fall sent mullet to the sea to spawn, I ranged further south looking for row fish between O'Galley and Sebastian Inlet. It was common to see school after school of mullet moving south, acres and acres of traveling, jumping mullet, hanging right on the surface and swimming with their lips out of the water like mullet often do. The giant, the giant pods of fish were a frenzy of noise and commotion as pelicans crashed and dolphins tore through them. You could actually hear schools of row mullet going by, even in pitch blackness. It sounded like water roaring over a, a waterfall. I graduated from high school in 1971, hoping to temper my crusade to become a full-time fishing fanatic. My parents sent me to Florida Institute of Technology where I studied oceanographic technology. We reached a compromise and I took a small boat down to Jensen Beach to continue my practice of doing homework at night while my nets soaked in the lagoon. I discovered that the southern end of the Indian River is really quite different than it is up by Titusville. Down there, there were tropical fish, the same colorful fish you see in saltwater aquariums, and there were banded coral shrimp and arrow crabs and different kinds of seagrass. For the first time, I caught barracudas in my nets. Soon after leaving college, I started running big boats out on the ocean. A brand new universe opened up for me and the Gulf Stream became my new playground. I was thrilled to see new species of dolphins and whales and sunfish and huge jellyfish. And I caught a wide ranging um, ocean fish like tuna, swordfish, and sharks. 
I spent the next decade on the ocean, fishing from Hatteras, North Carolina, to the Texas-Mexican border, a pioneer in the bottom longline um, fishing industry in the Gulf of Mexico. In all my travels on this country's southern oceans and inland waters, I never found a place that has the incredible diversity of wildlife and the variety of habitats that we have right here in our home. The source of that abundance is the Indian River. I left the ocean in 1987 and returned to Titusville to help out in my parents' restaurant. As the years flew by, I became involved in ecotourism, starting a birding festival in Titusville that secured our community's reputation as a superb destination for watching wildlife. Late one afternoon while driving home from a tourism meeting, I noticed that the setting sun was certain to put on a really good show. Lacy, icy clouds from the trailing edge of a coal front are always good for spectacular colors. I should have stopped at my house to catch up on emails, but the lure of the river at sunset was way too strong. When I got to Mims, I headed up Hammock Road, thinking about the world famous Indian River citrus groves of the past. They're gone now, the victims of freezes and citrus greening. The old groves are slowly turning residential. The good thing is that the lots are big ones, five to 10 acres or more. It had been a while since I'd driven through the hammock. I passed Burkholm Road and was surprised to see new young citrus trees. Someone had actually planted orange trees where an old grove once stood. Further up the road, homeowners had filled their big yards with new citrus trees. My heart was filled with hope for the citrus and fear for what I would find at the river as I pulled into Scottsmore Landing. I got out of my truck and pushed through the mangroves to get to the river. The water was high, way higher than it ever got when I rooted around this shoreline as an adolescent. Too high to tell if there were any fiddler crabs around. Climate change must be real. The water tells me it is so. The river was murky, just like my longtime friend Larry the Crabber told me. The surface was glassy, not a breath of wind stirred. Piles of dead seagrass lay rotting on the shore. It seemed like nothing was alive. I don't understand how this happened. This part of the river seemed healthy. There's no urban runoff here. Seeking some shred of normality, I stepped onto a rock by the water, closed my eyes, and listened for the mullet. I listened for the mullet, for without the mullet, there will be no predators. I listened for the mullet, and the, the memories came roaring back. That's what I'd done in my youth. When I couldn't find fish while running the shoreline with a spotlight, I'd shut off my motor and listen for them jumping in the dark. I stood on that rock and relished the clatter of dragonflies, the soft whisper of the wings of an osprey as it flew overhead. Clapper rails clicked in the salt marsh behind me, and a great blue heron squawked as it chased a smaller heron away from its prey. And then I heard what I'd been listening for, a flat, sloppy splash right in front of me. I opened my eyes in time to see the mullet jump again, flashing pink from the clouds in the setting sun. Another one jumped, and another one. They weren't very big. At that time of the year, there should have been great big mullet jumping, but they were mullet nonetheless, and I stood on my rock and happily watched them until it was too dark to see. As I turned to leave, the navigation lights on the railroad bridge to the south reminded me of a long past summer morning. I was heading to Mosquito Lagoon to run my pigfish traps and fish for trout. An interesting scene unfolded in the water ahead as I passed under the railroad bridge. I saw a lot of splashing and fins. No birds were diving, so I knew it wasn't a bait pod. I steered my boat toward the commotion to investigate and noticed a tremendous amount of dolphin, dolphins moving around this big ruckus. I eased closer, watching the rise and fall of multiple fins. Inching nearer still, I was stunned to see an oval ring of dolphin fins that did not dip below the surface. Four feet out from the ring of fins, the water turned in a second oval. 
a perfect perimeter of white water that surrounded the inner ring of fins. In all my hours spent on the lagoon, I'd never experienced anything like this. I cut my motor and paddled slowly towards the turmoil. I finally got close enough to see the center of frenetic activity and was amazed to witness something that few people will see. The chaos was directed at a dolphin in distress. Family and friends from her pod surrounded her, each one with their nose under her body. They frantically pumped their tails, paddling furiously to hold her up so she could breathe. I watched in silent awe. Their frantic squeals rang in my ears. When one of the rescuers tired, it dropped down to be instantly replaced by another of the circling dolphins. They diligently kept up this behavior, lifting their injured friend. I put down my paddle and leaned back to contemplate this emotional scene that I'd been so fortunate to observe. The wind finally pushed my boat far enough from the dolphins so I could start my motor without disturbing them. I humbly turned north and continued my journey up to Hallover Canal. After a day of fishing, I headed home, passing the spot where I'd seen the dolphins eight hours early, earlier. There they were, still holding up the injured dolphin, still doggedly supporting her heavy body to keep her from drowning. Who knows how long they kept it up. My guess is that they held up their friend until she drew her last breath. When I passed that spot the next morning, the dolphins had disappeared. The north end of the river doesn't look that much different now than it did when I fished it 50 years ago. It's wild and free, <coughs> bordered by a wildlife refuge on the east and development stopped by the railroad on the west. The river still looks the same. <coughs> Excuse me. The difference is the mullet are gone. The great schools of mullet, acres and acres of traveling, jumping mullet, hanging right on the surface and swimming with their lips out of the water like mullet often do. They're gone. Schools of mullet that you could hear going by even in the dark of night, they're gone. Spirits of our rivers, seagrass meadows, they're gone. We live in a world of ever-changing baselines. What seems ordinary to new generations would be unacceptable to those who came before. I will never see the Indian River the same way that my grandfather saw it. What's abhorrent to me seems normal to my grandchildren. They've never seen a shoreline covered with fiddler crabs or a water column that's filled with graceful moon jellies. They've never been able to pull an oyster or a clam from out of our river and safely eat it on the spot. One way to measure the character of a community is to look at what it protects. We protect what we value. Generations of my family and many others have depended on a healthy Indian River Lagoon to make our living. The economic worth of unpolluted water through the creation of jobs in the fishing, tourism, recreation, and other industries is well documented. It's been shown time and time again that property values increase in direct proportion to their proximity to clean water bodies. 50 years ago, our community launched humans to the moon. We must now employ that same resolve and creative technology as we search for answers on how to restore our treasured Indian River Lagoon. For she is the heart and soul of our community. The river can't speak, so we must be her voice.
Our river needs help and we must be as steadfast as the dolphins as we hold her up so that she can keep on breathing. Our economy and our quality of life depend on her survival. If we don't do something to help the lagoon, this is what we stand to lose. Seven billion dollars a year in economic um, income because of our lagoon. It's crucial that we build a lagoon friendly ethic among our citizens so we can return our lagoon to a healthy state. Some are already doing so. Together, we can do this. We will know success when once again, the Indian River can support a thriving commercial fishing industry. When that happens, everyone else who depends on the Indian River for a living, they will prosper too. People will be able to recreate without fear of touching the water or eating the fish and the specter of canals full of dead animals will just be a bad memory. I will work as hard as I can to see that day. I hope you will too. Thanks again for your gift of the opportunity for me to share your valuable time today. Thank you. Wow, that was excellent. Thank you so much, Laura Lee. Um, that was amazing. Uh, thank you for sharing your stories and the picture, pictures. Uh, the way you describe things and all the pictures that you showed doesn't seem like it's real. Like it seems like it was almost like a fairy tale you were talking about. Um, and so uh, I hope that we can get the Indian River Lagoon back to um, its previous uh, abundance and beautifulness. So we have a we can open the floor up for questions. I see a couple of um, comments through the chat. Uh, a lot of people saying amazing. This should be a PBS show. That's awesome. Um, let's see lots of thank yous. Uh, wonderful about the history. Okay. Um, can you repeat? Uh, we protect what we value. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure. Let's see. Okay. They want me to yeah, repeat it. Yeah. That. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. So she will repeat it. Um, and so I did get um, one question in the QA. Can you discuss the importance of horseshoe crabs and migrating wading birds? Um, that relationship has to do with a lot of migrating uh, birds relying on the horseshoe spawning, um, and they rely on the horseshoe crab eggs uh, for their primary, a huge source of their food um, when they're migrating from the north to the south or south to the north. Um, so that's why uh, horseshoe crab spawning events are so important for uh, wading birds. And they're also valuable for medical research too. And um, <clears throat> there's, they're, they're, they have um, iron in their blood, their blood is blue, and they have a coagulating property in their blood. And so if you ever get an inoculation from a hypodermic needle, that serum is going to have a little bit of horseshoe crab blood in it so that the blood will clot after you get this um, inoculation. So I found that slide. Oh yes, go ahead. So one way to measure the character of a community is to look at what it protects. We protect what we value. That's, that's an excellent quote. Let's see. Um, so from HSWRI, fantastic story. This is why everyone should be a naturalist. Definitely agree. Uh, okay, so we have another question. Um, what can we do as members of community to do our part? Volunteer. Volunteer. There's all kinds of opportunities. The Marine Resources Council has endless opportunities to volunteer. You can, well, you, if you don't, if you don't want to go out and plant mangroves or, or drag oyster bags around, you can be a volunteer or a docent right here at the Lagoon House. But there's all kinds of, Hub SeaWorld Research Institute, they have a bunch of volunteers that are working on shoreline restoration. University of Central Florida, um, Dr. Walters has, has had as many as 50,000 volunteers restoring oyster reefs in Mosquito Lagoon. There's all kinds of ways to volunteer. And then you can also, you know, like, don't put fertilizer on your yard starting now through September. Um, you know, 
or wash your car in the grass, not on your driveway. There's a whole bunch of things you can go to the um, Brevard County Natural Resources website and, and go to the Citizens Oversight um, Committee part of that website. And there's all kinds of um, suggestions on what you can do in your personal life every day to help the lagoon because every small activity and action matters. Exactly, well said. Uh, I did put a couple of uh, links into the chat. Um, our, our website, savetheirl.org uh, slash get involved. Um, if you're interested in being a volunteer or if you wanna find out more ways you can help, um, there's also great websites, uh, Be Floridian Now, which focuses on fertilizer ordinances and Lagoon Loyal, which also focuses on uh, fertilizer ordinances, washing your car, properly disposing of pet waste um, and uh, focusing on storm drains, uh, working on storm water management. And, and the Lagoon Loyal website, that's from the Brevard County Natural Resources Department. I I think they're still trying to get it right but once it goes up you can get points and you can get coupons and so you can get discounts at um, I don't know, like a bunch of local businesses um, you can get uh, you can get a 10% discount at Dixie Crossroads even so oh. look at that website you know when it get, gets um, live and do your part and um, and and get your coupons all right awesome so we have um we're going to let's um so where do rock shrimp live are they in the lagoon or offshore rock shrimp is uh, it, it is a uh, they really are a type of shrimp um they're not a panea they don't have soft shells they have a hard shell but rock shrimp and royal red shrimp which are caught further offshore do not use the lagoon as a nursery ground they actually spawn out in the ocean and live their lives and 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 um, die out in the ocean. Um, rock shrimp are caught in 90 to 350 feet of water. Um, the boats fish for them off the inshore side of the Ocalina Reef and sometimes the shrimp move over to the offshore side of the Ocalina Reef. It probably depends a lot on the, the it's right on the edge of the Gulf Stream so a lot depends on which way the current's running and things like that. But sometimes they're really deep Sometimes they're um, in 90 to 150 feet on the inshore side of the reef. Royal red shrimp, are, um, they're caught on the continental shelf roll down from 1,200 to 1,800 feet of water in a very muddy type bottom. They are caught in literally in the axis of the Gulf Stream. So it's a very dangerous fishery. Those boats that are fishing for royal reds are pulling nets against a four to five knot current. All right, let's see, we have another question. Um, let's see, so uh, one of the questions is, would the creation of an additional inlet increase water quality in the lagoon? Uh, do you wanna take that one or? Well, in, in my opinion, it wouldn't help that much because if you look at, <clears throat> look at all of the five inlets that are along the Indian River Lagoon, um, Ponce Inlet's very shallow, Sebastian Inlet's very shallow. Um, the, the St. Lucie Inlet's very shallow and the Jupiter Inlet's not very big. The only inlet that, that has a lot of impact on the water in the Indian River Lagoon is the Fort Pierce Inlet. And it's like, a, it's almost a quarter of a mile wide and it's 30 or 40 feet deep. There's a tremendous volume of water that, um, that flows through this Fort Pierce Inlet. I have a funny story about the Fort Pierce Inlet. My dad had gone down to Stewart. He bought a dredge. And uh, I was riding with him on the dredge. I was only like four or five years old. And he was coming north in the lagoon, and the tide was going out. And as he as he got even with the, the four years inlet, the tide was going out. It was going out so hard that he couldn't steer the dredge in, into the current or get past the inlet. So the dredge went sideways and it was going out the inlet. And um, fortunately, right as, right as dad and the dredge got to the mouth of the inlet, the tide changed and it started coming back in again. And so dad and the dredge drifted back into the inlet and then resumed their uh, journey north in the Indian River. Um, so there is some seagrass, you know, that's re that's coming back um, near the Fort Pierce Inlet, but it's only for a few miles, so it doesn't have an impact a long way from the inlet. The best thing we can do 
is exactly what we're doing now. Public education, changing our behavior, stopping the nutrients and pollutants from going into the lagoon. That's the best thing we can do. Awesome, thank you. Uh, okay, so that one's done. All right, so is progress being made with improving the lagoon? I believe it is. Yes. Um, now, we, we are in it, well, not anymore, because um, it's raining outside now, but we've been in a drought situation. Um, the river, has it's clearer, or it was before it started raining, it was clearer than it had been in 10 years. Um, me, personally, I've been seeing a lot more bait, um, a lot more mullet. The mullet seem to be coming back. Um, the people are starting to catch more fish again now. There's a lot of calerpa that's growing all over the bottom, which is, um, it's not a seagrass, but it's better than the bare sand that's just been blowing around on the bottom. And it does provide shelter for um, fish and crabs and shrimp. And I've even been told that manatees do eat it. Um, not exactly sure how much nutritional value it has, but I'm seeing signs, I'm seeing more birds too. You know, for, for, for many years, it was rare to see a pelican, but now I'm seeing flocks of pelicans, you know, flying by in their squadrons. Um, the numbers of birds are increasing. Birds are not gonna be where they can't eat. They're like me, they like to eat. And so the, the fact that there, we're seeing a lot more birds, a lot more gulls and terns and cormorants and pelicans and bait pods, that tells me that the river's getting better but we cannot take our foot off the gas. We can't, just because the river cleared up because we had a drought and we're seeing more birds, it's, it's not well. We have, to, we have to still keep doing, taking the muck out of the lagoon, stopping the pollutants from going in it. Awesome, all right, so um, we have one right here. Uh, did the mullet disappear because of overfishing, pollution, or what? The mullet were overfished um, for many, many years. There was a, a, a huge trade um, of uh, mullet roe. They, the, the, the bit, the, most of the overfishing happened when the roe mullet were running. And um, they, the fishermen would catch the mullet, take them to the dock. They would slice the mullet open, remove the roe, ship that over to, um, to Asia. And we would use the mullet carcasses. Um, I, I, that was mostly what I used when I was running the longline boat, for, grouper fishing in the Gulf of Mexico. So the mullet carcasses um, became crab bait and longline bait. Um, the, there, there's not very many fishermen left on the water now compared to when I was growing up in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Um, I, in fact, there's not even enough commercial fishermen to even make an impact on fish stocks now. The, the, the damage is what we've done to the place where the mullet live. I mean, they, mullet, they live in seagrass. We, we've lost our seagrass. We, the, the water's nasty. Um, I think that if we can restore the water quality and restore the habitat, the shorelines, and, and, and bring the river back to what it, what it once was, you'll see tons of mullet along with all the other fish. Thank you. Um, we are getting close to that one o'clock hour. Um, however, if we, we only have about two, two questions or three questions left. Um, do you wanna keep going? I'm not oh. doing anything for the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> okay, awesome. I'll sit here all day. <laughs> all right, great. Um, so if anybody else uh, needs to head out, um, you're more than welcome to. We will record, uh, we're recording this, and so we'll have all the additional questions posted on our website, um, but we'll keep going. So, um, all right. So one of the questions is, um, where can we buy shrimp without preservatives? Wild Ocean Seafood Market. And, and there are some other... There are some other um, dealers who care. Um, Whole Seafood up in Ormond Beach, they do a good job of, of providing seafood that's not loaded with chemicals and, and local. You want to stay away from imported shrimp because they're loaded with chemicals and um, you really don't know what condition the ponds were in that they came out of. If, if at all possible, you want to buy domestic American seafood caught by American fishermen. And, and 
over 90% of the seafood that's consumed in the United States is imported and, and or farm grown. And there are some farmers now in the United States that are trying to get some shrimp farms started. I'm, I'm sure that that's gonna be a much better quality product than what's coming from overseas. So yeah, do, do your research um, and, and shop, shop local, shop American. All right, that was good. Um, let's see, uh, one that was submitted a little bit ago. Uh, do you still fish? I do not. <laughs> I, I kayak now and look at fish. Um, how did the net ban 20 years ago affect you and Florida fishing? It was catastrophic. It destroyed entire communities. Um, and, it, and, and it pulled the commercial fishermen, a lot of them, you know, never were able to go back. The, the, you know, you can throw a cast net now and you can, you can catch some fish, but the water quality is so bad and the, the, the fish stocks are so low, it's very, very, it's almost impossible to make a living fishing in the river. But the, the worst thing that happened with the net ban is it pulled the people who were the eyes and ears for the lagoon off the water. So people that were out there every single day that could notice these changes that were happening, they're not on the water anymore. Another really bad thing that's happened is um, we have an overabundance of gaff top sail cats and hardhead sail cats now. And that's a direct result of pulling the gill netters off the lagoon because the net fishermen helped control the catfish. Now you have this abundance of catfish and they eat everything. They eat baby shrimp, baby trout, they eat baby redfish, they eat everything. They even eat seagrass. We've documented catfish with their stomachs full of seagrass. When they couldn't find anything, you know, good to eat, they were eating the seagrass because of the, um, uh, the things that are on the seagrass. So catfish are bad. If you've been fishing in the lagoon lately, you'll notice that there's a lot of catfish. They're like the blowfish used to be when I was a kid. You can't get your baits or your, or your topwater lures past the catfish to catch the fish that you want to catch. So um, that's the biggest thing that happened, I think. In my opinion, one of the worst things that happened was we removed the ability to control catfish and, and we pulled the people who cared about and watched out for the lagoon, we pulled them off the water as a result of the net ban. I lost you. Um. <laughs> um. Why has water quality decreased in areas such as Mosquito Lagoon, where there is not much development in the area? I can't answer that question. I, I, I have no, I, I, I'm as baffled as you are. I don't know. It's just like the head of the river. There's so little development. And then the wildlife refuge is on the east side. Mosquito Lagoon is completely surrounded by the wildlife refuge in the seashore. I, I don't I don't know why the water quality crashed the way it did um, in in the northern lagoon and northern Indian River and Mosquito Lagoon. Don't know. Do you? Uh, I'm not as familiar either, um, but that's something that I will look into and I will post more information on our website. Um, has anyone had success in growing seagrass? Absolutely. There. Um, there's uh, four, four entities that I know of that are working on, on seagrass. Um, sea and Shoreline um, is a for-profit business based in Tampa Bay. Um, Jim Anderson is a sod farmer that taught himself how, how to grow subaquatic vegetation. He's been doing it for 20 years now. Harbor Branch is growing seagrass. The Florida Oceanographic Society is growing seagrass. And um, there's a researcher named Bob Bernstein who's been working with other, other entities. Um, he knows a lot about seagrass, so he's been working, working with the other entities. I think the city of Satellite Beach is doing something with Bob and um, either Harbor Branch or Florida Oceanographic Society, but they're doing something um, where they're planting seagrass. We did a, um, 
a project that I was involved in next to the Merritt Island Airport runway. Um, we actually used seagrass that Jim Anderson from Sea and Shoreline harvested when they extended the um, runway for the Merritt Island Airport. He took that seagrass back to his farm in in uh, Ruskin, and he and he kept it there for two or three years. And then when we had the algae blooms and we lost all the seagrass, um, Jim called me on the phone. He said, "Hey, I hear you guys need seagrass." He said, "I have your seagrass, and it's re that's really important because it was seagrass that came out of the Indian River Lagoon, so it has the same DNA and makeup that our seagrass." So it's, it has a better chance for survival than if he had taken seagrass from like Tampa Bay, which by the way, has recovered enormously. Um, it's amazing how their seagrass beds have come back over there. So if they can do it over there, we can do it here. Um, um, are there, are, are there parts of the lagoon where, due to pollution, it would be unsafe to eat any of the seafood caught? Um, I would be careful about eating seafood that came, you know, from around near where the um, wastewater treatment plants are. Um, I'd be careful about eating stuff out of some of the ditches that, that go into the lagoon or it, it, after a heavy rainstorm near where some of the um, rivers dump into the lagoon. Uh, right now, the water is, has cleared up so nicely, I, I wouldn't be afraid of eating um, sea, you know, seafood from the lagoon. I just wouldn't eat it every day, but to eat it, eat it once a week, it should be fine. Yeah, and that, that'll be mo more of like a personal preference too, yeah. um, depending on the person. Um, some people have recommended eating more of the seafood closer to the inlets because you're getting a little bit more like flush flow. Um, but yeah, definitely don't want to eat any um, filter feeders that are right near outflows of storm drains and uh, wastewater treatment plants, just in case. Um, okay. All right, so we had another question. What impact do you believe the massive number of clamors south of the NASA causeway had on the Indian River in the mid 1980s? Catastrophic. It was catastrophic. They overfished the clams. And then and and I think that's a big part of of you know why the water quality deteriorated because when you pull the filter feeders out and not just the clams we haven't had oysters in the northern end of the Indian River since the 1990s. So when you pull the filter feeders out and, and, and the water quality starts going down, it's hard to get it back again. Th there's no question that the clams were over harvested. I will not argue that at all. Um, what part of Big Sugar yeah, what part of Big Sugar plays a part in the demise of the Indian River Lagoon? That's a complicated question, and it, and it affects more the southern end of the Indian River. It doesn't really impact the uh, northern end of the Indian River. Um, the whole water controversy, you know, has been bad, not only for the Indian River Lagoon, but also for the Caloosahatchee River, and the area around Sanibel Island, Fort Myers, Port Charlotte. Um, the, the need for storing water and having water available for the sugar farms definitely makes it difficult to, um, you know, to, to have a normal things happen um, for the lagoon. So, that's a really technical question that I'm not qualified to answer. I am very opinionated, though, that the the sugar farmers are not helping the lagoon. Um, there is 
oh gosh, what, it was Florida Oceanographic Society did a presentation on cyanobacteria in the lagoon and they addressed a lot of the big sugar impacts on the lagoon. Um, so I believe it's Florida Oceanographic Society. They have recorded webinars. Um, it was like two or three weeks ago. I'll post the link um, and they go in, he goes into de detail about um, the effects of big sugar on the Indian River and the causing of al algae blooms. Um, not, 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 not necessarily just big sugar, but changing of the water flows. Um, another question, uh, are all counties doing their best to help restore the river? I think some are doing better than others. I, I think we're a leader here in Brevard County. Um, we, we're collecting the most money. Our citizens voted to tax themselves to do these projects to help clean up the river. Everybody's doing their part. Um, but I, I think Brevard County is a leader. I think we lead the pack. Now we have a lot of great things going on in Brevard County. Um, as we mentioned earlier, we have the Lagoon Loyal Program, which is run uh, by Brevard County and MTM Advertising. Um, that website will be want, launching July 1st, um, and there'll be a lot of um, things that you can do that are lagoon friendly, that'll help get you points and get you coupons for a lot of great businesses in and around the Indian River Lagoon. Um, I think that was the last question. Any other questions? Give it one more second. Alrighty then. Um, if there were any links that were shared, um, I'll make sure that I have them listed on our page as well and any additional information. Um, so that you can email us if you have any questions. Um, this recorded presentation will be posted on the Marine Resources Council website um, in the next day or two. Um, and if you have any additional questions, please feel free to email me or uh, Laura Lee and we'll have her email added, if that's okay. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's just my name, Laura Lee Thompson at AOL.com. Don't expect an answer right away. All right, awesome. Sometimes I don't look at emails for days at a time. That's the way to do it. All right, awesome. So I think we got everything. Um, so thank you all for joining. And I am going to end this presentation. Bye. All right, bye. Thanks for watching.